So anyway, so this kind of skepticism that this view generated um, leads to skepticism in just about anything else. Skepticism about whether we know there's a real world. Skepticism not only about whether we can know that we have an immortal soul like Plato, Socrates, and Descartes worried about, but skepticism about whether we can even justify that we're now the same person who was in here in this class on Monday. How do we justify that? Hume challenges that. Um, you know, so if you have the existence of the external world being challenged, our own nature being challenged, certainly Hume challenges whether or not we can prove uh, God's existence. Um, and, and, and Hume also challenges the basis of morality. For him, uh, we can't establish a rational basis for morality. Part of what we're going to see in utilitarianism is a reaction against David Hume, Hume's claim that we ought to be skeptical about morality and think that uh, morality is just uh, a matter of feelings rather than anything we can reason about. Um, utilitarianism was one reaction to Hume, one way to say, no, we can reason about right and wrong, about moral principles. Um, but Hume says, no, hey, it's all a matter of sentiment, you know, and custom. Um, and, and, and if you don't have a David Hume, you don't have a Jean-Paul Sartre questioning whether we have any um, innate character or any human essence. Um, you know, Sartre comes along saying, oh, we don't have any human essence. We've got to remake any meaning in life, remake our own essence. There's no pre-existing human nature. Well, we're, you know, Sartre didn't grab a view like that out of thin air. We're going to see the Hume challenges, the basis of our claim that we have um, a pre-existing human nature, you know. And so you get later somebody like a Jean-Paul Sartre saying, oh, hey, you must be right. We can't prove we have any kind of a human nature, you know. But the reason you get these later philosophers is because of what went on in, in this part of philosophy in British empiricism. Well, anyway, the, the key to understanding Locke's essay is to understand what he means by idea. And, uh, you know, we, we looked at the definitions of idea he gives as so broad that they cover just about everything. An idea is uh, anything we're aware of mentally, whatever it's the object of. The understanding for Locke is kind of like the seat, the part of us that's aware of what's going on around us. You know, the part of us that experiences the world. This for Locke, you know, our inner self is what he's talking about is the understanding. So he says whatever um, happens to us in our minds is is uh, for him described as as an experience first and foremost of ideas you know and 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 as we said if you think the mind is only acquainted with its own inner mental life and not anything directly in the external world it becomes very hard to bridge the gap between um, what I'm immediately aware of and what is real. And, and we saw how hard that was for Descartes. Uh, and the British empiricism, the British empiricists who cannot rely, as Descartes did, on innate ideas to get them out of trouble, um, basically 
end up in skepticism. So an idea for Locke can be an abstract thought like 2 plus 2 equals 4, but it also um, comprises some things that you and I don't normally call ideas. The smell of a flower, right? The sight of a bird. Um, ideas can be internal for Locke. If, I, if I'm concentrating and I say, you know, I've got a pain in my arm or my knee, that's, that's an idea. Um, we've done a lot of feeling cold lately. That stupid song by Mick Jagger has been banging around in my head, you know. Oh, I'm so hot for her and she's so cold. Cold. She's so, I think I have cold on the brain. <laughs> Uh, so, anyway, um, feelings of warmth or cold or memory images. So you can see uh, ideas for Locke or basically anything we're aware of, anything the mind experiences is basically an idea. So he slaps just about ed everything with the word idea. And they can come from, and we're not, I, I'm not going to dwell on this distinction, but they can come from things outside us, right? From what we observe around us, from our senses. Uh, things like colors, feelings of heat and cold, hardness, softness. But also from introspection, these folks thought that, that we could reflect on what's going on in our own minds and, and we come up with, with a view of the mind that Descartes gave us, that um, the mind is kind of like a, a quasi-mechanical machine where mental processes occur, like perceiving, doubting, believing, reasoning. Um, only these are immaterial processes in an immaterial medium, the mind. So ideas are of two kinds, complex and simple. And basically, the complex ideas are conglomerations of the simple ideas. Now I know, this, this is like examining the leaves on the trees. But if you can get this down, you can see how somebody like Barclay can come along and say, there's no telephone. There's only, or the only thing that constitutes the telephone is mental things, our ideas of the telephone. Barclay comes to that conclusion. Locke thinks we're in a real material world. In other words, if John Locke were here, he would say, hey, look, this table's the same table that was here on Wednesday. No, on Monday. We are on Wednesday. <laughs> on Monday. Um, My idea of a red telephone is a complex idea, and it's composed of the simple ideas of the various properties of the telephone, right? I have ideas that relate to its color. It has a red color, its shape, you know, uh, whether it feels cool or hard to the touch, you know, the size, the weight, the sound of the telephone. All these are the separate properties that go up. Um, the, they're the simple ideas that combine to make the complex idea I experience as the telephone. OK. So, and the ideas we get from our senses are of two different kinds of properties. And it's really important to understand this distinction between primary and secondary qualities or properties for Locke. Um, if you can get this distinction down, you will know what's going on in everything the British empiricists are saying. Right. Um, primary properties for Locke are properties that really are in things in the world. Secondary properties are basically subjective. They're in us. They're caused in us by the primary properties of things, but they don't exist 
in things as they are in the world. Um, so the secondary properties are subjective for Locke. In, in other words, they're dependent on our perceiving minds. And they include things like colors, tastes, smells, feelings of heat and cold sounds, usually things that relate to only one sense. Um, I mean, let's go back. Consider colors. Uh, to, to see how this, uh, I think you can illustrate, my, uh, my dad was colorblind. Um, in other words, when he came up to a traffic light, now I'm not, presumably hit the experience he had looking at that traffic light was different from the experience I have. He couldn't see the red or the green. You know, how did he know whether it was red or green? Well, if you're colorblind with yourself, you know, it's by the position of the light. Which one's lit up? He could tell that. But um, being colorblind, he didn't experience colors the way you and I do. And, and if you look at something like this, it becomes very plausible to say, well, colors are subjective. Now, I had one of the guys that I once roomed with when a bunch of us were in a house in grad school. His idea of a snack was toasting an English muffin, putting some cottage cheese on a plate, and having a bell pepper. Now, my view about those kinds of peppers is I hate even the smell of them. My mother made a dish, stuffed peppers. And when she made that dish, I couldn't even go in the house. I mean, that's how much the smell had adversely affected me. And yet, for my college housemate, I mean, that was a great thing. Um, you know, I mean, smells do seem to be subjective to a degree. Well, well, Locke uh, says that the, these things are, are, are in us and they're caused by the light, but they're, they can vary from person to person. Feelings of heat and cold, since it's been so cold, let's talk about that. I just bought a pair of gloves and I was looking for a pair of really nice leather gloves and the the ones they had where I was shopping was so expensive, I thought, well, I'm just going to have to go with the ones that are on sale that aren't leather. And part of them's fabric. And I don't like that because I, uh, the gloves we used to get when we were kids were fabric, right? And, and they'd get wet. And they're useless when they get wet, right? Well, I can remember, like, we, my brother and I would be out on a lot we had, still, it's still there in front of the house, uh, and we'd be sledding, and we had these little gloves on that were worse than useless, right? They get, and so our hands would get cold because our gloves would get wet from the snow, and we'd get called to come in for dinner, and we had separate hot and cold water. And I'd come in, and my hands were so cold, I'd put them under the cold water, because that was the easiest one for me to reach when I was a little kid. And it felt like it was warm water, because my hands were so cold. And this is, this is the type of argument that Locke used to try to convince us that heat and cold aren't really in things as properties. Um, but they're subjective, and in us. I mean, suppose we had uh, three pails of water. One of them's hot. Let's say this one's hot water. This one's cold water. Maybe you got some ice cubes in it. This is not so hot you can't put your hand in it, but it's hot. 
and this is like room temperature or lukewarm. Well, suppose you put your hand in the hot water and say you put your other hand in the cold water. Now, if you take your hand out of the hot water, how is the water, and, and you put it into the middle one, how's this water going to feel to that hand? It's going to feel what? Cold. Yeah, it's going to feel cold, right? You've just had your hand in hot water. And if you had your other hand in cold water, the room temperature water is going to feel the way it did when I came in from the snow right? It's going to feel warm. I say, well, wait a second. The same thing can't have two opposite properties at the same time. The same water can't be both warm and cold at the same time. So how do we get out of that contradiction? Well, we conclude, um, and this is called a reductio ad absurdum argument, the way we get out of the absurdity of claiming that the same thing has two opposite properties is to say, well, the properties aren't really in the water. They're in us. They're subjective. They're caused by stuff in the water, but they're in us. Barclay also <coughs> provided additional arguments to support Locke in this claim that the secondary properties were subjective. Suppose you come in, right, and uh, you're in a house where there's either a big stove or there's a fireplace going on, right? And on a cold day like we've been having the last two days, it's very pleasant to come in the house and, hey, there's a fire. You kind of warm yourself by the fire. And Barclay says, well, you know what? A low degree of heat is a, it, is a type of pleasure. It's a pleasurable sensation to us, right? feels good to warm your hands by the fire. But now you might get a little too energetic in trying to warm up too quickly and get too close to the fire. If you get too close to the fire, you actually burn your hand. You have to pull back, right? You say, oh, man. Well, he, Barclay says, well, an intense degree of heat is a painful sensation. It's a pain. So a lesser degree of heat is a pleasure. A more intense degree of heat is a pain. Now Barclay says, consider this. You wouldn't say that pleasure and pain are in the fire as properties of the fire. So why then would you want to say that warmth and cold, that degrees of heat are in the fire as properties of the fire. They're only subjective and in us. Now, now, these guys are slick. They will talk you out of your wallet. Um, but that's, you know, that's the type of argument that even Barclay used to, to make a point like this. So, you know, and here I just described the experiment that I just went through. Okay, so primary qualities are different for Locke. They're real properties that are really in objects, and they include things like size and shape. I mean, consider the blackboard over there. Um, for Locke and for Barclay, um, the color... You can say, well, that's a blackboard with um, aluminum, you know, silverish aluminum. But for Barclay and Locke, the color of the blackboard is subjective and in us. It, it's not a property of the board as it really is out there in the world. Um, likewise, a silver color. Or if I touch this metal, or I touch the board and I say, well, it's cool to the touch. The coolness is caused by the primary properties of this board. 
for Locke, but it's, it's subjective and in me as I experience the blackboard. However, uh, so those are secondary qualities, the color, feelings of coolness. But for Locke, the size of that blackboard really applies to the blackboard as it is in the real world. It's really an object that has that size. Plus, you look at it and you say, well, the shape of the blackboard, well, it's rectangular. Well, the rectangular shape of the blackboard is really a property of the blackboard as it exists in the world. And so Locke makes a distinction between primary qualities, things having to do with size, shape of something, the motion of the molecules in it. They, they, they knew about molecules back then. Um, Locke was a friend of Newton and Boyle. I mean, he got it from the source, right? So Locke says, our ideas of them do genuinely resemble them so accurately, so they accurately convey knowledge of them to us. Now, here's the way Locke thinks we know something about the blackboard over there. Um, we have... not as many people as we like, but say there's 14 of us in here. Um, what the mind immediately experiences when we look at that blackboard is an internal mental image of the blackboard, not the blackboard itself as it is in the real world. However, the point I made last time is none of us have seen President Barack Obama in person, but we're sure we know what he looks like because we've seen images of him in the media, you know, on the Internet, in newspapers, television, right? And those images, we think, accurately represents what the president looks like. Uh, I, I said I was at the Ravens game, uh, last home game, and the images on the screen, you could see, accurately represent the guys walking around on the field. You know, you look through binoculars, okay. See that play? Okay, let's watch replay. Looks just like it did on the field through the binoculars. <laughs> My brother has... Reserve seats, but they're up in the nosebleed section uh, in the end zone. <laughs> you know, we're not in any posh uh, place. But, but at any rate, to get back to this, so what's going on? Now, now think about it. Those of you who are in this row are having a different experience of the blackboard than I am standing off to the side here or than you all who are way down here. Now, how does Locke account for this? Well, what's going on, he would say, is that if we have 14 people in here, and say we're all looking at the blackboard, you've got 14 different private mental images that our respective minds are immediately acquainted with. And those images are different because of our perspective. But for Locke, they all represent numerically one blackboard that exists in the real world. <clears throat> okay, so we've got 14 different private images, but like 14 different television pictures, they all represent one and the same. Um, thing, the blackboard. Now, and so he says, my, my private image of the blackboard uh, resembles the, the qualities, the primary properties that are really there in it, you know, of, of uh, its size and its rectangular shape. My private image 
is rectangular, and it sees the blackboard to be a particular size. So, so then what we experience, and if you can get this down, what we experience privately as an object out there in the world, whether it be the blackboard or a telephone, as far as our private perspective goes, um, what we experience is a conglomeration of images that represent uh, that that represent the primary and secondary qualities of the object. So, to us, what we call a material object, like the blackboard or a telephone, is just a combination of its primary and secondary properties. You know, its its size, its shape, whether it's hard or soft. Those are primary properties, but also whether it's cool or warm, whether it has a color or not, those are secondary properties. And they all go together to make up the telephone or the blackboard. Um, but again, not all of these properties are in objects. So for Locke, something like the red color of the telephone is not really in the telephone, but it's produced in my, our minds by the motion of the molecules. But, this, but things like the size and shape of the telephone are really properties of it. That blackboard for Locke really has the size we perceive it to have in the real world. It really has a rectangular shape. Now, Here's the problem. You say, you say, well, okay, why go into all of this minutia? Well, if you argue that all of us, that none of us, let, let's say it this way, that none of us experiences anything in an external world directly. What's going on if there's 14 of us, and somebody else just came in, is we're all experiencing our own internal mental representations of the external world, our own internal image, if we look at something like the blackboard. The problem is, how do we get behind that image to confirm whether it's accurate or not? I mean, I was talking about um, The ravens, you know. I, I, the way I used to illustrate this is that there, um, in the early 90s, I was at, at one point I was looking for what, what was state of the art then, a hi fi stereo VCR at the stereo place. And projection TVs back then were not flat screen, they, they were ones that had, you know, projectors either in them internally or they were projectors like this, and there was a separate screen. And, and, and so the store wanted to illustrate, because I remember when these things first came out, like we used to play backgammon in the 1970s at um, things like what was in a Ramada Inn, and, and they'd always have one of these projection TVs in the bar, and they were always misadjusted, and the colors were terrible, and they were... Fuzzy. Uh, in other words, when these things first came out, they were pretty bad. But by the 90s, when I was looking for my VCR, they, they had come a long way, and, and the colors were pretty accurate. And the way they tried to illustrate this was um, by shining a home video camera onto a doll on a chair, and you could see the doll in the chair and the camera pointed at it, and then feeding that picture into all these television sets. Well, now, if you wanted to judge whether these television sets were accurately reproducing what the doll looked like, how would you do it? 
I mean, we're not talking about anything deep here, right? I mean, just commonsensically, what would you do? Right? You'd look at the doll, the, the thing the camera's pointed at. And say, okay, the, the, the color, that's what it looks like. Okay, what does it look like on the screen? You compare the two, right? Well, a way to see why a view like Locke's is so problematic is, suppose you could never see what the doll looked like in reality. Suppose you could only see pictures of the doll. How could you justify your claim that, that those pictures accurately represent reality? Well, for Locke, as human beings, we never experience anything in the world directly, but only our internal mental representations of it. So how do we know that those represent representations are giving us accurate knowledge? Well, Locke thinks that we do. But Barclay and Hume come along and say, well, how do we really know that? How do we get from I have a mental image of the blackboard to the claim that that mental, private mental image accurately represents the blackboard as it is in the world. Um, now, so there's a problem in knowing whether our private mental image of something represents things in, in the view that Locke holds, which, which is, among other things, called indirect realism. This is called a representative theory of perception. That is, we don't, we never perceive anything in the world directly. It's represented to us by our private mental images. So, Locke is a realist. He thinks that there's a real world out there. It's going to be there when he leaves the room. But we never experience the world directly, only our private images of it. And so indirect realism, Locke's view says the doctrine, uh, you know, we cannot know the real world directly through our experiences. We must infer what the real world is like from our experiences. But this logical leap from the world that I experience it um, is the same as the world as it really is, seems unjustified. And this is what eventually leads to skepticism in David Hume. Since we perceive only our ideas directly and never what they represent, we can never compare our ideas with reality to check their accuracy. In other words, um, to go back to my illustration about the stereo store and the TVs, you could check the accuracy of the picture on the screen by looking at the doll and looking at the screen and comparing the two. But as human beings, all we have is the screen of our own minds. We can never get, as Richard Rorty used to say, we can never get out of our own skins to compare the world as I experience it with the world as it is and, and be able to make the claim, okay, well, the world as I experience it uh, in many ways accurately represents the world as it is. Not only don't we know that things in the world are like our representations, but let me take my illustration one step further. One time I went in there and I looked at the television sets and there's the picture of the doll on them. But the camera, but the doll's not there. The camera was playing a tape. There was no doll sitting on the chair. Uh, and what does this illustrate? Well, this is how we get to a view like Barclay's. Not only do we not know that our internal experience of the world accurately represents 
the real world to us, we don't know if there's a world beyond those experiences. You know, for Barclay, there is no material world that causes our experiences. There's only the ideas. And for somebody uh, like Hume, Hume's going to say, well, there may be a real material world out there, and there may not be, but if the only thing we ever have present to our minds is what Hume calls the perceptions, what Locke calls the ideas, and we can never go from the view that our per internal perceptions of the world accurately represent the world, or that they represent anything beyond themselves. Maybe they're just caused by the mind, as Descartes speculated. Maybe it is all a dream, you know. Well, so, so this indirect move is something that Locke can't really justify. He's sure we live in a real external world, but if the only thing we have experience of is our own private mental life, very hard to get to that external world. And I'm going to stop in a moment, but um, to, you know we'll look at Barclay and Hume next time. But Locke, I mean, holds that there is a, a real material world. Now, Barclay is, I mean, Locke was some kind of a Christian believer. He wrote a book on Christianity that I have on my shelves. Um, but Barclay was a very devout Christian believer. He later became a bishop in the Church of Ireland, besides being a university professor at Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland. And Barclay says, wait a second, you know, some people, as my mother used to say, you give them an inch and they take a foot. There are some people who you give them the assumption that there's a real world of material things out there, and they want to go all the way to concluding that the material world is all that exists, that God doesn't exist, and we don't have an immaterial mind or soul which, of course, undermines traditional Christianity that holds that we have both. So Barclay wants to defend the faith against materialism by cutting the legs out from under the stool of the materialists and showing that there really is no such thing as a material world, that what we experience is a world that God basically causes us to have. Um, what we experience is a combination either of our own ideas or of God's ideas. And you say, well, how do we get to this claim of Barclays that everything's ultimately mental? Well, it goes back to this, uh, this conclusion of Locke's that what we experience as a material object is just a combination of its primary and secondary properties. Well, if Barclay can show that all of these are subjective, not just the secondary, as Locke believes, but the primary qualities, then all of the qualities of a thing are subjective and dependent on a mind for their existence. And that's exactly what Barclay tries to do with Locke's view. He tries to show that Locke is right that the secondary qualities are subjective and he tries to also defend the claim that so are the primary. So what we think of as a material object is nothing but a collection of immaterial mental ideas. So we'll look at this.